All right, so I've been playing Medieval Dynasty New Settlement, and I'm not gonna lie, this is already one of my favorite games in this type of genre on Quest. Medieval Dynasty is a game that, in my opinion, pushes the needle forward for VR and how in depth a survival game on a mobile platform can be. Elevated by its open world aspect, I do want to talk about the performance as it's a major talking point for the game, but I'll discuss it further down in the video with a side by side comparison. Keep in mind, Medieval Dynasty is still very much a Quest 2 game with scale quest 3 upgrades but a quest 3 enhanced version is in the plans if you want to see that comparison when it comes out subscribe to the channel though i want to talk about the game itself first then the story a comparison and close out the video with my overall thoughts the game at its core is janky but it's the good amount of jank that is acceptable you just work around it the end goal of the game is in the title to build your dynasty and ensure that it lives on even after your time is up because within the gameplay you do age over time and it introduces different seasons summer fall and winter which is a lot of fun to experience firsthand and it gives the game a much needed change of pace as well as having dynamic weather and a day and night cycle giving the perception of living inside the virtual world of medieval dynasty eventually everything you build create and gather will be given to your descendant your kid it does have a romance option when talking to npcs though i haven't gotten that far into that part of the game yet though i'll follow up when it gets updated it allows the players to build and shape the world however they want while also targeting hardcore and casual players this title is a combination of several genres in one it's a survival game as you have to hunt eat and drink in order to survive or if you don't want to get along with anybody you could just steal from the npcs and shops and lose reputation it's up to you you also build your outpost that is separate from the other towns craft and build your own home by hand trying to expand your dynasty in the settlement you can build multiple sized houses crafting stations storage rooms taverns farms and you can even cultivate your own crops with building it out you can also hire workers to take part and manage it for you with going into the main town in the game you also have to pay tax which caught me by surprise there is no escaping the tax man medieval dynasty is also a sim type of game as you get tools and weapons you have to craft and build them yourself you also have the option to gather ingredients and cook multiple types of dishes on top of that it's also an rpg as there is a skill tree that is progressed by repeating said actions like hunting in game and completing quests to give you skill masteries with all of this each journey is different and it's up to you with how you want to approach certain situations it has a little bit of everything for everyone if i were to compare this game to green hell this title is much more lenient this game might seem daunting at first but as you build out your dynasty and become familiar with the controls the pieces come together you understand your limits to survival what to do and not to do and on the contrary it's also a really chill game with great utilization of vr mechanics doing things in game is really satisfying to kick back and relax as you organize and start off with your own little home and eventually build towards a functional town its gameplay is addicting and as you progress you want to build more and more and if you want to skip out on the survival aspect and play how you want there is also a sandbox mode that allows you to build anywhere have immortality unlimited stamina and unlocks everything from the game's mechanics and you choose to play at your own pace or if you want you can make the game even more difficult the game is exclusively single player and it's included story is text-based none of it is voiced kind of a missed opportunity if you ask me these simple voice lines are basically hey good sir and see ya later hopefully down the road they end up getting real voice actors as the story isn't very compelling apart from the fact with completing storyline quest it unlocks more stuff to do and craft in the game without spoiling the story it amounts to an innocent little town not being so innocent and you start uncovering the bad things that are happening along the way you find interesting personalities though this title is far from being polished as the reason why i give it such high praise is that it shows a lot of promise and potential to deliver something that can only be experienced in vr with the fact that this isn't another magical fantasy or shooter it brings something new to the table some of the game's problems is that it's still really buggy in certain areas it's kind of confusing what to do next in order to proceed with the storyline or certain sequences will break the story entirely and you have to wait for a patch to address it also worth mentioning that if you're looking for a melee combat survival game this isn't exactly the game for it as it feels like an afterthought combat is very light and unresponsive at times though i do think over time it can be improved upon as the devs have been vocal and receptive of player feedback with updates it's headed in the right direction since the game does have plans to eventually be able to release dlc alongside the game right now the devs are focused on patching up the game as much as possible so it's in the devs best interest to not tarnish the reputation of the game it's 
It's been a while, and yes, the game utilizes application space warp. I've been a big proponent for games in a lot of my reviews for apps to not use application space warp, as 9 times out of 10, I would prefer my games to always run natively. What application space warp does is that instead of rendering the game at a native 72 hertz, it does so at 36 hertz, halving the frame rate, which most people would call 36 of those frames to be real and the other 36 are fake frames. And it almost seems like magic, which in hand allows for extra compute for the developer to work with on standalone titles. It allows developers to have more to work with. It's basically DLSS 3 with frame generation, but for Quest. Meta does say that artifacts are hardly noticeable in the documentation to most users when implemented well, but switching back and forth, there is a noticeable compromise and one of those is perceivable latency. In-game actions feel noticeably more choppy and you sort of feel disconnected from the in-game world. It doesn't make the game unplayable, but you always feel it and it's always there. Even with the boost on Quest 3 with the XR2 Gen 2, in terms of resolution and extra performance headroom, the game still stutters. Application Space Warp isn't a fix-all tech and requires effort on the dev side. It also has the usual artifacting associated with Application Space Warp like image warping and issues with transparent objects and readable text being blurry while moving. Or at times it would throw a fit and cause you to restart your headset in order to fix it. Though I would say in faster paced games like Assassin's Creed Nexus and Underdogs, Application Space Warp is much more of a problem and noticeable since they are fast paced combat games. This game is kind of the opposite, expect to engage in combat but it's a fraction of what you actually will be doing in the game. I find Application Space Warp to work much better in this as it's more tame in comparison to others. It's a technology that is here to stay if we ever want larger scope games to be able to run off a battery. You can push the game further with Quest Games Optimizer and a lot of those limitations are at the cost of less playtime. It's also worth mentioning that both versions of the game heavily use fixed foveated rendering, spatial resolution scaling, and have low levels of detail. And they do suffer from really bad aliasing, especially on Quest 2, aliasing jaggies get very ugly in certain instances. They get the shimmering effect, and I do record the footage at 1440p to showcase what I see inside the headset as close as possible with Quest Games Optimizer and uploading to YouTube. I will include a screenshot of how the metrics look like without recording on Quest 2. It's not as bottle capped on the GPU side, and the frame rate is much more consistent. But overall, I would say that the game looks good considering it's not as dense as Asgard's Wrath 2 and tries to fill the scene with foliage. The major difference, of course, for Quest 2 is the cost of resolution. That is to say that although it's not Red Matter 2 levels of graphics or intense like Asgard's Wrath 2, I found it pretty enjoyable. Overall, I think the game is a lot of fun and definitely worth checking out as I have way more to go and I have around 13-ish hours and half of that time was just exploring the world or working around bugs. But if you're skeptical, that is completely fine and it's worth waiting to see if the developers stick to the word on patching up the game first and releasing an eventual Quest 3 upgrade. I wasn't expecting to like this game as for my reasoning with coming out with this review so late from launch and yeah that's pretty much it. If you liked the video drop a like, leave a comment about your thoughts on the game and subscribe for more reviews, news and VR content. Until the next video, see ya.